Brahman, you ready? I am ready to go. All right. Coffee, you finished it? Yes, sir. Fully caffeinated. I've got my caffeine, my morphine, my... um. <laughs> I, uh... That's so good. We're so yeah. going to keep that in. Yeah. <laughs> Tayyib. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to another episode of the Mo Show podcast. Uh, Abdurrahman, welcome. How are you doing? I am extra hyped and hyper, ready to go. Because of the caffeine or because of, uh, you know, you're at the Mo Show Studios? <laughs> Please I say the say, second one. Please say the second I one. I would say uh, Mo has laced his uh, coffee with something. It's making me <laughs> extra happy. You know, uh, on these Nespresso cartilages is like from one to ten. Mm. And I made, I made sure that he got the, uh, the the ten so I can get as much out of you as possible today. There we go. <laughs> Abdurrahman al-Jifri has been running the Accelerators program at KAUST, which is King Abdullah University for Science and Technology for the past 11 years. Uh, their latest program is Taqaddam, which uh, is part of the KAUST Entrepreneurship Center within the university that has graduated over 130 startups. That's a really, really impressive figure. Uh, and what's more impressive is that they attracted about $78 million in funding. Yeah. Now, one thing is that we've graduated more than 130. The 130 is the current active number of startups. But, you know, in business, not everybody is able to succeed. Mm -hmm. Some projects uh, continue to fly and soar. Others don't. They learn. They reformulate. So the number of graduates is actually higher. But we always want to uh, keep an eye on the metrics, keep an eye on the portfolio, how many startups are active, just so that we're honest with ourselves and continue to improve in the future. I, I know that 10% of startups, if I'm not mistaken, you can correct me, 10% of startups make it. Is that number too high? So 10% uh, of startups make it. Uh, that, that statistic is uh, classical. Uh, it's usually um, there's an asterisk of after five years. Um, that's why... Uh, whenever people are like, what's the survival rate? It's like, well, it's hard to tell because we need to wait five years. <laughs> but, uh, you know, all indicators are showing that survival rates are trending up um, mm. because the ecosystem is matured. Uh, founders are getting better and better. Entrepreneurs are becoming wiser. Mm. They have more mentors, more role models they can lean on. Um, a lot of these founders are starting their second companies. They have early employees leaving. There's more knowledge around. Um, there's been other statistics that uh, incubator or university-backed uh, startups uh, are as high as uh, 30 to 40% in terms of survival rate. So there's all this uh, research being done on different models, uh, different outcomes. Uh, which isn't to say that, uh, you know, as a founder, uh, looking at these statistics is going to make or break it. You know, that's going to be the day to day. But as people who are observing kind of the ecosystem and looking at different models, it is helpful to continually uh, re-up things every now and then. It's, fasc it's a fascinating world for someone who isn't involved so much in it. You know, I mean, we see uh, the uh, the streets in Saudi, be it uh, in, in retail or restaurants. And um, and you really feel that there's a drive from the Saudi youth to want to open their own thing. Gone are the days where the dream was to get a job, just a job. You know, you, yeah. what I, from, what, from what I see that, that is that is happening on the ground is that Saudis want to be business owners. And, um, and, and you know, a lot of the credit uh, of that has to go to people who are in positions like yourself, where you are creating those dreams become a reality. Yeah, it's um, you always need the first stories. So a lot of incredible founders started when we were starting, you know, 2011, 2012. I think when we kicked off Venture Lab, it was the first accelerator in the country. Um, and back then, you know, what you would look for in a team was just people who were committed to actually stick it through. Um, you know, it was it was a matter of, oh, if this person gets a job offer from Aramco in a couple of months, will they vanish? Uh, or any other like government slash private sector, big names. Uh, versus, versus now, like we're seeing the opposite. We're seeing people are quitting, you know, very lucrative, cushy, high paying jobs because they feel like this is the chance, this is the moment, I have something to prove, I wanna be part of this wave. 
Um, so it is nice kind of seeing it uh, from the perspective of, oh, um, we need to be really careful about talent uh, because if we don't uh, keep them, uh, they will go off and do something. And maybe they should, you know, there, there's a real value there. Did such a thing exist before, uh, you, you know, this department within KAUST was established 11 years ago? Was, it, was there anything uh, such as incubators or accelerators in Saudi Arabia? There were incubators. Uh, I think Badr was uh, what I was seeing active at the time. They had different uh, incubators um, in uh, different universities. They had a, uh, an incubator in Riyadh, an incubator in Jeddah. Uh, they were fairly widespread. Um, but, you know, it was still early days. Um, I, I don't know if it was... I don't know if it was about having uh, a ton of incubators active. Incubators typically pool resources, uh, so you have access to the office. You don't have to pay, you know, rent. You don't have to worry about uh, finding uh, a great lawyer or an accountant. Usually, they aggregate these services. But what accelerators did is they they provided this kind of framework, the skeleton of oh, a beginning, middle, and an end. Um, so what, what an accelerator does is it gives you, as a founder, um, a framework. It gives you this guidance because starting a company can feel so vague, so um, so opaque. You have no idea where you're going. Am I progressing? Am I not? Is this the right direction? Um, and, and it tends to feel very disorienting, especially if you've had really good structure your entire life. Where it's been like, go to school, get good grades, go to the right university go to the right job, operate, and it's always been very pristine. And, you know, especially people who are type A, who are very precision driven, who who are very detail oriented, that p part of it can be the hardest mentally. Um, and an accelerator A shows you, oh, you are not the only one struggling with this. I'm seeing other people in similar uh, uh, journeys, but I'm also seeing who are people who are maybe one or two years ahead of me. Um, that I can lean on, that I can ask about, that it's fresh enough in their mind that they still have relevant information. Sometimes I'll see uh, I'll see people going to like leaders in the field, renowned experts, uh, talking to them, and they're not getting the feedback that they were expecting. It's like for that person, those early days are are not quite as fresh. Like the minute details are not always fully there. For some, it is. It's like a day one mentality always. But others, it, it's helpful to seek out somebody who's like one or two steps ahead of you. And that's what, you know, uh, that kind of community brings together. And I think that's what's so special about accelerators. That's why we're seeing uh, more demand for them. That's why we're seeing more of them pop up now. And it's, uh, it's super important. And I think more and more uh, needs to come into play. So technically, what one of the things that you guys do is you create safeguards for startups to avoid pitfalls. Yeah, uh, it's uh, one of the biggest the uh, uh, one of the biggest shames is um, uh, you know human potential being wasted and being wasted on times and mistakes that are unnecessary. If there's typical mistakes that first time founders tend to make because the mistake is intuitive it, it is it is human nature to make this mistake um we need to make sure that that doesn't happen um because you know we can save months uh, if not years in, in a founder's journey doing that we try to mistakes will happen but if they do at the very least they're cheaper so they're not quite as deadly to a startup's journey um because the early days are very formative, they're very brittle. Uh, if you are with a couple of colleagues, some friends that you've cobbled together to create this ragtag team, um, every single uh, contact risks kind of testing that, testing that, testing that, where, and every success is able to build that momentum. So our role is to make sure that they build up such a good momentum in the early days that it becomes its own thing. It has its own force. After the accelerator is done, they've picked up enough speed and they're continuing to hurdle ahead. It's very hard to stop it. So if we put enough pressure uh, in the early days, 
we can get there versus oh you know let's let's just have fun with this let's not get into such an, an official accelerator format all this we'll work every other weekend and you know maybe we'll find some time Abu Flan, are you around hey do you want to meet today oh, i'm busy well fine we'll do it next week and then it kind of just stagnates and it loses that it loses that momentum and a lot of incredible potential is wasted because of that because of lack of momentum yeah it's just you, you, we just need to push it so that it's actually something. Yeah. There is permission to let it go, to let it vanish into the either because we don't see it as something yet. And you know, it, it and it builds up really dangerous habits um down the line because if you're starting to hire people and your early hires are seeing, oh, you know, this person isn't fully committed, they feel an implicit kind of sense of, oh, I'm I'm allowed to kind of phone it in, do the minimum possible. And you know, it eventually turns people away. They, they, maybe they haven't uh, a clear idea of why this didn't go. Why am I seeing this other startup is able to succeed, is able to hire a team? Um, so there's a lot of very smart, intelligent people who know uh, how to build a product, who know how to execute certain things, but just that feeling of needing to put uh, a lot of pressure in the early days, of needing to the sheer power of making something from nothing uh, and how deliberate one must be and how unpleasant it is, but it has to be. Um, it's everything. Yeah. Talk to me about the journey of your job description or your job. Students come to you and say, Abdurrahman, we have this idea and we'd like you to help us see it to fruition. Can you walk us through that journey? Um, sure. So I actually deal with a small amount of students. The accelerator with Taqaddam, we invest in about uh, 60 companies uh, per cohort from all over the world. So sometimes they're idea stage, deep tech companies. Sometimes they have an initial product and a, you know, a minimum viable product that, that's shown some premise a uh, product market fit, or maybe they're international, they're all over the world. Um, some of them are full-time founders, some of them are about to be full-time founders. Some of them are students, especially from KAUST. You know, we don't have an undergraduate program, so they're mainly uh, masters, PhDs, and postdocs, and researchers, and beyond. Um, so we, we, we have other programs that help students that are in the initial exploration phase. Right, I want to learn about this. I want to understand if this is for me. So we've got ideation programs, hackathons, challenges that they can participate in. Um, but with the accelerator, there's funding attached, there's expectations, and it's super competitive. Like you've got, you're competing with your application against startups from all over the world, all vying for a chance to get into this cohort. So if this is not like a serious commitment of I am here not just to learn, I'm here to start a company that is my express purpose, then the might be a bit overwhelming. Now, in terms of how that's done, um, essentially goes into a couple of phases. So the is unique in its construction. So there's a lot of great programs. We are the first to create like a local brand. You know, this is not an offshoot or um, an expansion of an international program is something purely homegrown, right? Um, and that gives us freedom to play around with things a little bit. It's longer versus it's double the duration of most accelerator programs. Why? Because that's what makes sense for us. We've seen two advantages. Number one is we are able to serve these deep tech companies that you know, maybe they have hardware, maybe they need to pilot with um, a utility company, uh, uh, and those pilots take time, and that is necessary to get them to a stage where they can actually fundraise and talk to investors. If we were to just stick with a shorter timeline, that wouldn't be uh, so easily accessible. Number two is it really allows us to build uh, much deeper bonds with the companies over a much longer amount of time. Now, on the flip side, that means that uh, we don't have as frequent application cycles. So right now we only accept applications once a year. 
right? So that's that's opened in March 10, and that's going to close this year in May 21st. And every founder who talks to me, um, you know, in June, July, is like, oh, I'd, I'd like to join Taqaddam. It's like, ah. Oh, I... wait 10 months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, as a result, uh, we, we go bigger, right? Instead of having 10 to 15 startups each cohort, we have to go with um, 25 to 60 startups per cohort. It means we design everything at scale, um, designing it hardware, uh, sorry, hybrid first, so that we're able to uh, cater to the founders who are in uh, UAE, who are in uh, Europe and elsewhere, um, that are expanding to Saudi. So if a company is abroad and they are applying to Taqaddam, they're applying for the express uh, purpose of getting to the program, benefiting from the community, and expanding to Saudi. If they're not going to have a presence in KSA, uh, then it doesn't make sense for them to join a Saudi-based program. So it's not just the Saudis who are applying through your program for the startups. It's also foreigners who want to enter the market here. Yes. Uh, we think that's uh, super important, super valid. I mean, one of the biggest uh, pushes for KAUS since the university was built uh, was economic development and uh, innovation at its core. And part of that is helping the best companies locate the Saudi, choosing Saudi as its destination, hiring people here, transferring that talent, because those people will then create the second generation of founders from everything they've, they've learned. If you're going to create the best company in a category, we want to make sure that Saudi is the place mm -hmm. for that. Whether you're in deep tech, whether you're in biotech, water, desal, energy, or if you're in fintech, logistics, banking, and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, you, when you know, you just touched on um, attracting companies or or people to wanting to expand their business in Saudi Arabia. What came to my mind is the recent regulation of. Uh, companies, if they, if you know, if you're doing business in Saudi, you need to be located here in Saudi. Um, how will that, as a regulation, do you feel um, accelerate? No pun intended. Uh, your your business, if uh, if at all, it does. You know, you 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 want to be in Saudi, so you have to um, set up shop over here. You can be based in Dubai, which is where many companies are, and their biggest. Uh, income by country is Saudi Arabia. Does that change the landscape at all for you? I mean, I think that regulation is mainly for um, government contracts. Um, so it, it is a factor. I don't know if it's the main factor. Uh, most startups are targeting Saudi as a market because it is the biggest market. Because often we've seen this happen with founders where they open in Saudi and in six months, 80% of their revenue is coming from Saudi. Yep. So they realize, holy crap, this is significant. I need to be here. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't make sense yep. for me not to invest in this footprint. So I don't think it's being driven by regulation. But what that regulation does is it creates um, this ecosystem of these larger companies moving to Saudi. Um, if all of these companies are moving the regional HQs, then you've got higher talent density. And those talented people might choose to then start a company, might choose to hire, might choose to bring people. And that will only serve to empower more uh, creativity down the line. So I think it's, it's helpful. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it will immediately correlate to more founders being there because uh, founders are... Uh, are typically looking for really good quick sales. Though they're selling to industry, they're selling to private sector, they're selling direct to consumer. Uh, in some cases, they would, uh, in rare cases, government would be an early uh, customer. But you know, it's not uh, it's not what uh, most typical founders will go for. Um, Vision twenty thirty, a million layers to it. Mm. Uh, one of the things that I feel does affect you is <clears throat> its movement to. Um, be a logistics hub for uh, goods that are passing through the region. Oxygen comes to mind. Uh, just, uh, I think it's going to be the Neom area. Um, just the visuals of that. I'm going to, you know, with, with permission of, of of the people at Neom, I want to put a picture up on on YouTube right now, just to show because when I remember seeing a bunch of ads, you know, on the highways that take eight or nine lanes, and I'm like, wow, that's it looks like the future of dry docks and and 
and logistics. Yeah. Does the vision 2030, does that see more applicants for startups hit your desk? It's it's not just the volume, it's the quality. The quality. Um, and, and I was noticing, uh, I was reviewing like the entire history of the accelerator, you know, year to year to year to year. And every time I look at, you know, the this year's cohort versus last year's cohort versus last year's cohort, and I'm looking at the level of applications, the quality of the effort people put in, um, and these are not like uh, fresh grads. These are people who have been in industry, who have started companies before. Maybe this is their second, third company, and they're putting their best foot forward in starting this venture. Uh, and I'm seeing it a lot. It's like, wow, you know, when the the application I saw uh, three years down the line that got accepted would have no chance comparison to the level of competition that we're getting now, which is always part of our thesis, right? When we designed the program, the structure as is, um, the founders are getting uh, $40,000 uh, in the beginning of the program and then $100,000 follow on. Uh, you know, we're not taking equity. We're not, uh, this is not a loan that they pay back. We don't want people in debt as they're first starting their entrepreneurial journey. And it was always um, the goal that you want the most founder friendly program out there that will attract the best startups and be a real catalyst, a real focusing point of talent. Uh, and we wanna make sure that this is the prime destination for them. And in an environment where there is a lot of investor money flowing around uh, and the competition is for the best companies, the best founders, the best entrepreneurs, the best opportunities, that is the right strategy to go for. Right, and now it's starting to pay off. I think last year we noticed a fifty percent spike in applications, uh, which you know we're we're likely to experience again. I think we had over eight hundred last year. We're also gonna, yeah, we'll we'll see where it, where where we end up. But eight hundred applicants, eight hundred and thirty four uh, different startup uh, applications. And how many did you take in? Uh, so we we go with different phases. So. Uh, just to give you a sense of uh, of the of the uh, uh, selection process, so um, I think over three thousand had started a draft application. The submitted ones were uh, eight hundred and thirty four, and from the eight hundred thirty four, we do the online screening, and we filter them down to the top uh, two hundred and fifteen. And then we interview uh, those one-on-one -on -one and select uh, the top uh, 63 as of last cohort. We'll work with them for a month at the boot camp, get to know them a little bit better. And then from then uh, we went on with uh, 44. And then we'll have a, in the middle of the program, we'll have a midway review from the 44, 37 continued. And those 37 are the graduates of uh, last cohort. 37 out of an initial application figure of 3,000? Yeah. So 1% make it? Pretty much. Pretty much. Wow. And I mean, it's... it's yeah, uh, I'd adjust my seating posture as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I tell people, it, and, and people sometimes get discouraged um, when they hear those numbers. Now, it is very rarely a case of the company is bad or good. Oftentimes we are vetting three things in terms of criteria. We're looking at the product, we're looking at the market, and we're looking at the team, most importantly of all. Now, after we've looked at all these three things, we are looking at the most important category from the perspective of the founder. Taqaddam fit, can we contribute? Can we add value to this company? Um, in some cases, we don't see ourselves adding value. A, you are far too uh, progressed in your journey to join an accelerator program. You are in a business model or a market that we don't feel we can contribute to. If you're starting something like, um, you know, I'm starting off a new restaurant, I'm starting off a new cafe, you will be teaching me. Uh, I won't be able to help you as much because that's not where our core expertise lies. 
So it's finding the the founders whose uh, whose timeline, whose business model aligns with the program. So we make sure that they're not just there um, because they can be. Like that, it's really valuable. That at the end of the journey, that this was something that uh, truly shaped uh, their you know their time in uh, in their company because you know it's a, it's a new baby. You know, it's very formative. Uh, everybody who's uh, every parent can can attest to uh, the value of formative early years and then how that uh, how that pays dividends down the line. Totally, absolutely. I have two questions. Yes, sir. I'm trying to think which one I should throw at you first. Um, in chronological, you mentioned that banks or lenders don't take equity, and they don't require you to pay back the loan. We, as the Taqaddam Accelerator, are funding the $140,000. We don't take equity, and we are not giving it as a loan. Uh, banks will typically not uh, touch early-stage startups anyway. Um, now, if you are a company that has a few years in the market, if you are profitable, um, then Kafala and all these other SME programs would uh, give you lending, but I think those banks would want their money back. <laughs> so, so here's here's the the standard, right? Most accelerators you've got you've got accelerators are typically uh, for profit, right? I am investing in these companies to get a certain percentage of equity. It could be anywhere from three to seven percent, okay. right? Um, the whole point is I am helping these companies increasing their value, helping them fundraise, and making sure that I will be able to profit when they sell the company, when they IPO, when they exit. It's an investment vehicle, but with some programmatic elements uh, attached to it. When when you don't have a profit motive, we don't have a profit motive. Our job is to create impact, not to make returns. Now, we track this as diligently as we would if we were investing uh, for a return, because we think that's a really important practice. And if we wanna make sure that investors continually see value from the cohort and the brand means something, that it's a, it's a badge that startups wanna wear with honor, then we do need to be very, very tough. That's why we're, we're very strict in terms of who gets accepted, who gets in, who benefits from the program, because that's super valuable. <clears throat> So that's kind of what throws people off. It's like, well, why are you doing this? Well, it's because of we want to look at how many jobs we've created, yeah. how much funding has come into Saudi uh, from both local and uh, regional and international uh, venture capital. And all of those have huge knock-on effects. Now, if we were to shift to a for-profit or uh, an equity-based uh, model in the future, it would still have to make sure that it doesn't compromise those core goals of impact, right? Kaust was put um, on the map to make sure that there's real tangible impact in Saudi. So this is being funded by the budgets that are allocated for Kaust? Yeah, it's uh, funded by both Kaust and SAP. It's just an, an amazing uh, facility to offer up and coming businesses and and I and I can see you know why you you know why you guys would do that because if you if you fund this particular person one day he can you know develop into a company that uh, that has 50,000 people and look how many jobs you created yeah and uh, you know we've we've noticed a lot of things were done as an experiment and then we we find these surprising knock-on effects right after so one of the things we've noticed is because we are not on the cap table, because we're not taking an equity position, um, a lot of investors will kind of look at us as, oh, you know, it's it's great. Join this program for every startup that they want to talk to. Because, okay, A, the program will increase your quality. Your cap table is gonna, isn't going to get crowded out. Um, it means that we don't have to worry about negotiating um, valuation in the early days. Uh, and that that's allows us to accept a much larger quantity of founders in the early days. So that model is still being refreshed and evaluated. Like if you look at the U.S. leading accelerators like YC and elsewhere, um, they're, they keep adjusting uh, their model, how they do follow on funding. So people are still innovating and you have to always keep abreast of what's happening with the ecosystem. Regulations are changing. 
the amount of capital sloshing around uh, the ecosystem is is changing rapidly. Yeah. Uh, sectors and uh, what is hot right now versus what is going to be uh, keeps fluctuating. So if we're not, if we don't always have our eye on the pulse, and we you know we we'll, we'll be left behind in the dust. Very tricky. I mean, if you were to look back on your first year in 2011 compared to 2022. Probably two different jobs. Yeah, night and day. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, I, and uh, it's it's funny that um, because it's become such a an important thing, people have recognized like the value of entrepreneurship. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people trying to. Okay, we want to create this now. Um, can we do like a taqaddam too? And uh, uh, and it's like, well, you could, but. You're not looking at all the years of work that it took to build up. We've tried so many different models. We've run, we've ran different models of accelerators, different scales, different target segments. Uh, Taqaddam itself has changed. So uh, the first three years, it was focused on university-based founders. So it was all over Saudi, but you had to be affiliated to university student staff or faculty uh, or a recent alum. Uh, because we were running two accelerators, we were running the 910s, we were running uh, Taqaddam, and then uh, 2020 was a huge year for us. Uh, COVID came, um, and a lot of uh, accelerator programs across uh, the region and across the world had you know, kind of stopped and paused. We th- saw it as an opportunity to actually redouble. So 2020, we doubled the size of the cohort. We went from 30 to 60. Uh, we doubled the size of the initial funding. We went from 20K to 40K. Uh, and we started accepting international uh, companies in that uh, in that cohort. We started off small and increased it from then on. It was, it was a chance to show that, you know, this is something that we're serious about. We've been doing for years. And this is a moment that really demonstrates conviction. Um, and, you know, it was a time to prove that not only can we grow the program, we can transform it and uh, to my team's credit um, like our timeline did not even shift one day in spite of pandemic we changed how we do things but not the timeline we wanted to make sure that we were the some we were something that was stable that a founder could hold on to uh, while the world was spinning um going back to 30 startups being accepted in uh, in a pool of 3,000 applicants. That means 2,970 odd were rejected. Do you have uh, statistics on how many of the people who got accepted are returning applicants, so they have failed once or twice or three times against being accepted first time? Because that kind of interests me. I, I love stories of, of people who, you know, fail I, I don't know it's not yeah. a taboo you know people make it out to be a taboo word but you know I've I was listening to the podcast recently and I, and I mentioned it on another episode um on another podcast that I was on in Silicon Valley if you uh come with an application or an idea or a startup the first thing they're going to ask you is what what have you failed at yeah it's almost like if you haven't failed at anything uh the meeting will be a little shorter yeah. but if you have Okay, let's see what you're up to. Ooh, you failed at this grade. Okay, let's t- you know talk to us about this. Oh, interesting. Let's put you in touch with these VCs. Let's see what they think of us. Put you in touch with this angel investor. Um, so, from the thirty, what's the ratio of first time I'm in against I came back having already failed or not accepted the first time? We don't have that as a number yet. It is it is higher than uh, one would anticipate. Uh, we have a concerted effort right now. There's a couple of people in the team that are working on the analytics that are looking at the piping. Um, part of it is because we have so many different programs. We've got uh, online education, we have Mughamrat Riyadh, the Entrepreneurship Adventures, uh, which is like an Arabic uh, MOOC that we launched uh, 2020. Uh, we've got... Um, the uh, the uh, boot camps, the hackathons. So it's figuring out not only who has applied multiple years, which is a significant chunk, and you know we we will see them. Oh, uh, hey, it's been one year since we last spoke. How are things going right now? How are things progressing? And I would actually take it a step further. One of the best signals uh, in a team that has started something that did not work out 
is if they start the same thing again. Because uh, sometimes they'll start a totally different company, but if they're actually attacking the same exact problem after they got burned the first time, it means that they are attacking it with real conviction and they know exactly what's happening and so much so that they're willing to overcome like that scar tissue to really attack uh, that problem again. And that's really sizable. Uh, and if you, you know, anybody who sees that, whether it's from the investor side, the founder side, like that's something that, uh, that I don't think is, uh, is talked about enough. Like we always talk about uh, taking, the ra- taking a chance uh, and uh, pivoting and changing and adapting. Uh, but there is something to be said for, all right, uh, don't block it out. <laughs> it, 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 it should not be that traumatic. Uh, it, it, it's hard, but uh, if you can face it directly, uh, there, there's some real uh, golden opportunities there. I think you hit the nail on the head when you said conviction, because these people are believers mm. in, uh, in their product or service. They have yeah. a vision. You know, yeah, we tripped, but let's approach it from this angle. And, uh, you know, we believe we have something. Those kind of people jump off the page, you yeah. know, the, the, the real believers. And I think that attracts the eyes of, uh, of investors just across the board. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. You want, you want somebody who, and this is probably one of the, the least appreciated uh, elements, um, occasionally, especially if you're dealing with really technical founders, they believe my product is really good. Therefore, it is the best thing. Therefore, I should be succeeding in a just world. And, you know, from the investor perspective, that's important. But if you aren't able to channel that conviction, if you aren't able to rally people around it, you, you will struggle in hiring. You will struggle in fundraising. There's so much that you need to really worry about if you don't take seriously the act of uh getting people bought into the vision and getting everybody along for the ride, getting everybody excited. Um, so that's something that, uh, that, that needs to be paid more attention to. Not, to, not that uh, craftsmanship and building something that matters isn't important. It's just, it's important that you do that and people recognize what you've done. Uh, private equity in the region has, uh, has taken off in the last 20 years. I had um, Hisham Farugi on, yeah. and he I mentioned love that, that interview. By the it way, it was actually one of the one of the yeah one of my favorite episodes because I I learned a lot. I mean, from him, this guy he, you know, he he started a business and then pivoted and then they, they launched NIT, and that's uh, you know operating in in dozen in a couple dozen countries I think at this point. Uh, I love success stories. I love go getters, and you know he is synonymous with both those words. Um, and he said in the early 2000s is when the landscape changed. Uh, private equity was, uh, was just on the brink of starting. Yeah. Um, h- how has that shaped the landscape uh, in terms of, of also, you know, you know what, what you guys do? Has that incentivized people? Just the, the presence of private equity in the degree that it, is a va- that, that, that it is present in Saudi Arabia, has that changed the landscape for startups in your, in your perspective? I mean, if you look at... Um startups, mainly they're looking for uh, venture capital, right? And if you're looking for venture capital, you want to make sure that you have leverage as a founder, right? In the early days when the ecosystem was just in in, in its infancy, um, there were a handful of investors actually deploying capital to these startups. So as as an entrepreneur, you have, you know, if, if these five uh, funds say no, you don't have a lot of options unless your model allows you to bootstrap and you can be highly profitable early on. Um, But now, because there's a lot more venture capital out there, because there's more funds of funds, because uh, the government's allowed uh, a lot more uh, and encouraged a lot more activity in this phase, uh, in this space, uh, as a founder now, you get to sit and decide who do I want to invest with me? Who is most aligned with me? Who has the right vision that I have? So you find the investor that fits your company instead of changing your company to fit investor tastes, so to speak. And that tends to lead to a lot of better outcomes. And you'll see 
uh, incredible things like uh, people leaving uh, VC funds to start companies, people leaving uh, highly lucrative positions to start companies because it's seen as, oh, okay, this is now the right moment where the power is with those great founders, as it should be. It should be capital chases the most efficient uh, uh, teams and companies and products that will utilize it to drive really incredible outcomes. The more that's allowed to happen, the better. And the market is much more efficient now for it. Mm -hmm. And it rewards good behavior. If, you're, if, you're, if, if you are one of 10 investors trying to get into a deal and you're seen as, you're known as somebody who's highly ethical, helpful, uh, helping founders regardless, pays it forward, um, you should be rewarded for that. And that only happens when an entrepreneur gets to be choosy. The, the fortunate ones. Exactly. The good, fortunate ones. Good, good position. One. Good problem to have. What do you look for uh, in a company when you are, you know, what's what's a something that is pleasing to the eye? You know, you look at you know income statements or balance sheets. Is there something that you look for immediately and say yes, okay, they're good there. Let's now look further. Uh, two things. Number one is the team. Um, the early days are really tough. And probably the biggest source of startup fatality is team collapse. Um, people argue, could be for all sorts of things, different visions for where the company should be headed, um, uh, differences on how equity should be handled, all sorts of things. Uh, different motivations in terms of how, how hard they want to work and you know what they want their lives to be like. Um, so making sure that A, the team has a really strong bond, A whether it's they're aligned and passionate about a vision, maybe it's a medical company and a lot of the team have like a personal attachment to solving this problem. Uh, they have relatives or family that's been impacted that drives, uh, that, that causes them to have a unifying thing that says, oh, you know, in spite of our differences, let's focus on how do we achieve this? Uh, maybe the team has history together. They've worked with each other in the past. They've known each other for years. Those bonds can uh, help them overcome uh, speed bumps, and you know they they're able to pick each other back up. Um, so sometimes, for one of our conditions is uh, we don't accept solo founders. So you can be a founder with a with a team of employees, or you can be a bunch of co-founders. But one individual on their own is not something that we accept, and that's just because. Uh, we've looked at the data, like we've seen the the survival rate for solo founders. It's Sweet. very, very low. And it's hard, you know, they, if, if, if you as a solo founder get sick, um, get caught up, you need to care for a relative, whatever, life happens. It's high risk. Exactly. The entire company uh, collapses because of that. Nobody can accept that risk. And if you can't, the main job of a CEO is to get people excited about a vision and build a team around it. And if that can't be done, then what does that bode for in terms of the team going forward? So the team is something that we really look at, history and alignment. Um, then uh, we'll look at uh, the product itself, like what attracted the team to this product? Why are they building it this way? What is their unique vision in the world, their unique insight? Um, is it a case of I'm adapting an existing model uh, into Saudi, or I see like, for example, with the IT, I see a white space that is untapped that needs um, something that, uh, that, will, that will satiate this need that's been written off too early. Um, so that, that initial view of the world and where it comes from is super, super fascinating and captivating. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the lenses that one looks at. What's the story with uh, with fintech and why is it really taking off of here? I came across an article in Arabian Business recently that said top 20 fintech companies in the region. I'm like, excuse me, do, are there 20 companies operating in the fintech industry in the region? <laughs> what is it for the person who just doesn't get it like me? Uh, essentially, it is an entire category that has been opened up because regulations have opened up. So when a bank releases a product, they need to go through a billion and one checks and balances. 
because they're dealing with so many constituents, there's very strict compliance and approval processes. Um, with financial technology, uh, a founder, a startup can tackle a, a much more specific problem. So I could look at, oh, um, I wanna provide financing for these kinds of customers, for these kinds of categories. Now, something the scale of a bank might not be able to narrow down and look at this minute segment because it doesn't move the needle for an organization this big. But for a startup, that could be like a way to get into a market. So I'm providing something that helps SMEs manage their spending. I'm providing something that helps the insurance sector uh, optimize their finances or uh, track more data. I can make these kinds of decisions because my tech, my product collects more information than uh, a bank or any other financial institution does. So I can make these differentiated products in partnerships with the bank. Um, and you've got now neo banks popping up. So you've got these new digital first banks with, uh, you know, more more pleasant user experience that want to be something that you enjoy using. It's like a cloud cloud bank, if you will. Uh, yeah. So uh, not not brick and mortar. I, uh, I think I might have just coined that term, but it's it's not there, but it's there. It's available. There's so many different models, and one that focus uh, ones that will focus on remittances, ones that will focus on uh, you know different customers, different needs. Um, and that's that's the magic of it. It's something where we all had to shop at Walmart. And now suddenly there's all these flavors available to us that we get to choose. That leads to more competition, that leads to more innovation, that leads to an explosion in fintech and investment. I think that's really what it comes down to. You know, you, uh, you, you able, if you are able to provide solutions to people, people could be running for you, running for you to come solve their problem. If you're a, a solution-based idea or startup or application, you know, Uber comes to mind. Um, and, um, and and now Airbnb and all these delivery apps, they, they don't own a single car, they don't own a single hotel room, but they are the facilitator between uh, the, the end consumer and the person who owns the asset. Yeah, and usually there's insight there, right? With with Uber, the insight was uh, with phones, we have a new kind of, we have a new source of information. So it's not that phones were better at the time they weren't, uh, but we didn't have ge geologic, geographic information. We didn't know where people were. Now we do. Yeah. What new kinds of interactions does that open up? Um, same thing as we look at... Uh, uh, some of them, some of those insights are psychological, like Snapchat. Why, why did people engage with Snapchat more than anything else? It was like digitized FOMO. Like if you did not click and watch that story, uh, you were going to miss it. Miss uh, and so that became the first thing that you check, the first application that you open, which led to higher engagement rates, led to influencers favoring it more and led into that kind of virtuous cycle happening. So if there isn't an insight, then what is it? Like there, there needs to be this core um, understanding, this, this puzzle that's being connected in a certain way uh, so that you've got something that's truly solving uh, a key issue that people either realize or don't realize they yeah. have. I remember uh, early 2000s, Many analysts predicted that the smartphone would not be a success. They said, you know what, people want a computer. When they get home, you know, they fire up the laptop and, and that is their computer experience. They want a phone to be a phone. You call, you text. Nobody wants to be on a web browser on their phone. Hmm. And then you just look at how wrong those people were. Just like some of the people that predicted the internet was just a passing fad in 1995 when Bill Gates was talking about it. I saw an episode of him on, on Letterman and he was talking about, and Letterman is like, um, so what you're saying that I can watch a baseball game on my phone? I mean, I have, you know, I have the radio for that if I'm on the move and I have the TV from at home. It makes me think, what are we laughing off today that is going to be the future. This whole metaverse business, which can be an episode on its own, scaring the hell out of me. Yeah, I mean, you don't even have to look as recent as the metaverse. You can look at gaming and esports. Uh, would be one that is relatively new and fresh, 
where people are starting to realize, oh, wow, this is actually a huge category. Uh, I was making fun of my kid or nephew for watching uh, somebody else play a game, watching a Twitch streamer or something. And now we're seeing uh, humongous investments and funds and organizations just to uh, create, publish, or uh, organize esports events around gaming. And that industry has eclipsed uh, both uh, you know, music and uh, movies combined. So it's it's something that was laughed off that then gets taken seriously. If we look at um, you know what we consider toys that suddenly are no longer toys, it becomes serious business. Um, Web three is one of those categories where there's a lot of debate. I mean, if you look globally, there's a lot of money, uh, venture capital money going around Web3, going around crypto, going around the potential for uh, decentralization in its many different forms. And on the opposing side, you'll see a lot of people talking about, well, what does this technology allow us to do that wasn't uh, already possible through the internet? Oh, you want to sell goods? You could sell goods uh, through uh, Counter-Strike. People sold goods for real money then, and you know they didn't need a blockchain to do it. Uh, what's the difference now? Now, it's easy to watch both sides, yeah, I mean, mischaracterize the argument and simplify it and dumb it down. It's like uh, that side will say these guys are just adding labels and techno babble to scam people out of money. The other side will say, oh, no, you are Letterman telling Bill Gates what good is the internet uh, because we can already do these things. There are these new applications coming. I don't know, <laughs> uh, but I do try to look at I do try to look at both ends, and I try to look at what solutions are people building in. So the current obsession for Web three is ownership and scarcity, right? Um, we can create digital scarcity. They, uh, if you go to you know kids now, like everybody's a sneakerhead, and you know it's like oh this drop, this rare thing, this collab, um, and can we create that in digital form? Can I give you this virtual toy? Uh, that's you know you've got even crypto and and toys like uh, that that are designed not to be complex, that are designed for a younger audience. And I give you the ability to buy or, you know, randomly get one collection of things for it in order to have that, own it, show it off to your friends. Then we kind of try to peel back. Like, okay, with the current generation, would they show off that digital thing? Like, how would they do it? Are they kids? Are they at school? Are they with their friends? How does that engagement happen? You know what excites me? An, uh, uh, an app or a product or a service that I've been using frequently, STC Pay, and this mm. is not a sponsor. So I've been able to transfer money wherever I am in the world uh, to any person at any time, and it's there instantly, and gone are the days where you have to go to Western Union or your bank. That's, is that FinTech on some level? It is, and now STC Pay is, uh, is a bank. Uh, and you know, suddenly something that was a small thing has ballooned into something significant, uh, almost being a ginormous player in the financial ecosystem that cannot be ignored. Uh, and it's something that you now look at, like, how was I, how did I live without this for all this long? And that's the best innovations, yeah. right? It's the ones that remove stuff, or the innovations that remove steps from your life. And now you just cannot fathom, like, how, where were you all my life? Yeah, 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 yeah. The disruptors. Yeah. Yeah, totally. What industries are you uh, anticipating might not be here by 2030? Is there something that's, you're like, ooh, this is uh, shaky? Let's see. I, I guess that uh, the most common answer uh, for this question would probably be traditional education. Um, but the funny thing is, like traditional education has been theorized to die for many, many years. Uh, every decade or so, oh, this is why the education system is no longer relevant. Uh, but you know, the thing is, it's not 
purely education. Like our education system is not designed just to educate. It's designed also as a form of signal. Uh, you know, you are uh, capable enough to get accepted into this school that says this about you, that says this about you. So it's also a, so a form of signal. Now, if some employers don't care as much. Um, now, if that happens, uh, the f- student side and the hiring side no longer use this as the uh, as the end all and be all signal. Then that might be an industry that gets shaken up, or at the very least, uh, gets reduced because, uh, especially the younger generation, are very financially aware. Uh, they're investing earlier. They're reading more. They're doing their homework more. So it's one that's making a lot more brave and uh, direct decisions earlier in their lives. And nothing is like uh, sacred or nothing is a given of I must do this uh, in, in terms of how they uh, how they chart their future. Um, so that's one I would say uh, might, you know, that's one that's highly susceptible to change. I don't know. It's not something that will be deleted, but it was it is uh, it is apt to uh, to be significantly uh, shaken up. Just about that, mm. one of, one of the issues that you know you you hear people complain about all the time is student loans and how long it takes to pay that back. If I'm not mistaken, um, it, it's it's around 17, 18 years. It takes them to pay that back or for a degree to become profitable. And if you're if you're sensing that the landscape is going to change, then that's just music to the ears of of people who don't have to go down the road of paying back student loans because universities are just dubbed these days as a ripoff. It's just too expensive. I'm looking at the West where you're paying thirty, forty thousand dollars a year. Is that, is that 130, 140 thousand dollars for a four year degree? It's a lot to shoulder. Plus, what does it get you? Like you're seeing a lot of. Uh, young people creating opportunities uh, by leveraging the creator economy, creating uh, writing, drawing, uh, sharing their art, sharing their craft, uh, starting on uh, media in general in all its forms, uh, and leveraging that into a career, learning coding, going into a tech hub. Suddenly, uh, there are these other steps that I can take that are more socially acceptable to take that many in my peer group are looking at. Um, so that is the biggest competition. It's because COVID has forced people to look around. You know, hey, uh, I'm I, I was on the roller coaster, uh, but the ride has stopped, and because it stopped, I get to you know look to my left, I get to look to my right, and see what the hell's going on. Exactly, and hey, do I can I jump off? Oh, apparently I can, and uh, it's up to me. Uh, and that's that's one of the magical moments. Uh, hopefully, uh, we learn uh, we learn a lot from these lessons. Uh, and I lo- I love the conversations now. Like everybody is uh, revising how they worked. Like why were we working this way? What does the future of yeah. our day to day work look like? Do I not want to meet anybody face to face? Do I want to meet everybody every day face to face? Do we want to meet some people some of the time face to face? And it's not like a unilateral decision. Everybody must follow this. Like some startups are built remote first and they will be able to attract a unique form of talent because they are there. Some people are, you know, 100% there. Some people are in between and everybody's building the tools that help the hybrid to function, that help remote to function, that help in person to function. And that's what we needed. Yeah. Further to that point, I think companies realize that we don't need 100% of our workforce coming in physically, and therefore we can reduce the amount of space we need to rent, and that takes off a bunch, uh, you know, from our top line in terms of overhead, uh, and and that's a huge takeaway I think for, uh, for for businesses. Some people are like, oh, why were we spending this money on rent? So I'm I was I'm paying money to bus my employees uh, all the way to work and then put them in an office, and then bus them home. Uh, I'm paying money for the bus. Yeah. I'm paying money for the office. <laughs> I'm paying money for the ride home. They're commuting, they're exhausted. Wait, why are we doing this again? And, and, and what are they doing when they're in the office? They have their headphones on, not talking to each other, everybody working in their own space. 
So now the decision uh, for these remote first companies like, well, yes, but I also missed that feeling of camaraderie. It's like, okay, how can we create that camaraderie? Okay, we can do um, retreats. We can take that money that we used to spend there and make sure that we invest it in getting people together, creating memories together, creating that culture intentionally. And now there's all this debate and research and experimentation on, well, how frequent? Uh, should we do something weekly, uh, small scale? Should we do something larger scale quarterly, a combination of both? And, you know, important conversations that, you know, how long have we as a species been working in like this office environment? And some people uh, are now starting to question, okay, what works for me? What works for the company I am trying to build? And uh, that's another uh, another opportunity for founders and entrepreneurs to really stand out. You can attract talent, not just by the number of, in terms of how much you're going to offer them in terms of salary. You get to attract them on the life that they want to live and how well it's aligned with your vision. I don't want to keep you here for much longer, almost 2.30 a.m. here in Jeddah, but it's Ramadan for all good. Uh, I'm going to just throw one more one more thing uh, at you, Abdurrahman, before we, before we let you go. Uh, so the amount of Saudis that, that come to you, um, you know, be it in, in the job that you're at or in your daily life, is, is there something that you would like to advise them on? Uh, in future, someone who's listening to you now at the age of, you know, before college, 16, 17, who has aspirations to start a business, what would you say to them in terms of bettering themselves or what should they invest on in themselves so they can be the best candidate to be accepted in a program like yours? I would say that the most immediate step is to live in the future. And if the future that you foresee for yourself is creating a company, working in a startup, starting a startup, um, then invest the time to be in that environment. Intern, uh, work for summer training, whatever it takes, be in that environment, be in that company. Watch like a hawk how these founders operate. Learn a lot. Uh, it allows you to punch above your weight class. And that will pay so much in dividends and you will learn so much uh, versus kind of just looking at it from the out, from an outsider looking in. Um, that gives you the fastest shortcut it, and engenders so many opportunities. And to not ask for permission, just to help out early on, whether it's content, intros, that practice really compounds over time. And very few people are willing to kind of take that bet. Um, you're seeing incredibly young uh, first-time fund managers, people who are Gen Z in their uh, late 20s, starting funds on their own, uh, building that presence on Twitter uh, because they have they're keyed into what you know what is next in Gen Z. There are some people who are looking to uh, get that insight that you know you have as, as somebody who's young, who's ambitious, who's got their eyes and ears open to the ground. That would probably be the most uh, the most bang for your buck that you could get in the early days. Is there a book that you uh, fell in love with that you feel that youngsters can benefit from as they gear up to entering university? So uh, there's one uh, deep work by Cal Newport, uh, and the reason is like the the. Uh, the world is so digital, so always on, so many tools designed to sap away at our concentration that being able to sit, focus, and do highly creative work uh, is being attacked. And as a muscle, uh, that is going to be more and more relevant with time. So that's probably one that I, I think needs more appreciation um, and one that I tend to recommend a lot. Uh, the other uh, the other close one is So Good They Can't Ignore You mm, by yeah. the same author, yeah. uh, which is more on the career capital perspective of how to plan your life. But if it, if I had to choose, uh, I still uh, think of things in a, in a deep, uh, deep work uh, methodology. Uh, I, I, I just it's just one of those 
one of those things that keeps ringing true and I feel like rings more true uh, with every passing year. Amazing. Thank you for uh, such information. Can we uh, put a link or, uh, well, a link, I guess, to Instagram or Twitter or however you want to be reached on in the show notes? Uh, of course. On YouTube. Links to the books that you uh, mentioned and, yeah, generally how people can reach you or articles that you uh you know enjoy and maybe want other people to we're basically going to get as much information from you as possible Perfect. link it in the show notes so people can reach out to you um and uh, um this was a, a very informative episode uh yani mashallah the, the spitfire of information that comes uh, out of you has reminded me a lot of uh, uh the person who i consider my mentor or or though i don't think he knows i exist he's the reason behind why i started this podcast naval ravikant there's something there they could be distant cousins i'm not sure but the way you articulate your thoughts are uh, are, are are just something that is just it's beautiful um i can see why you've been in the department uh of accelerators uh you know funding entrepreneurs in cows for the past 11 years you seem to be the right guy for the job 100 i'm downplaying that like you mashallah Adek. um thank you for 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 coming here and sharing everything you did no, i mean you learn a lot like i owe a lot of this information from arguing with founders who take the time to explain their thought process uh, they're the real heroes that really help uh, kind of push things along and drive that curiosity. Uh, and starting things is not easy. Like, and, and you know this, like you've, you've gone so far, like if you spoke to yourself just as you were starting, you, you've, it, it, and all of it compounded from that decision that I am going to start this, I'm going to stick with it. Uh, and, you know, the first couple of episodes, I don't care if they don't, if I'm going to nitpick, uh, I don't care if I don't like the sound of my voice. I don't care if I, I will still put it out there regardless. And that takes a lot of courage to put a show, to put art, to put products, to put companies out there with your name on it because it opens us up to criticism. Correct. And anybody who's able to surmount that deserves, uh, you know, all the reward that they get and the recognition for their hard work. So thank you for uh, the time tonight. I loved the, you know, the variety of the different topics that we tackled. Uh, and you know, it's uh, podcasting is very intimate. Like I've been listening to you for the past uh, couple oh, of wow. weeks. So uh, it, it does feel like uh, even stepping in, uh, it's the first time we meet face to face, but it just felt, uh, it just felt more than that, which is it's just hard to capture. It's hard to un to put into words why the relationship with this feels a lot better but it is something that uh that the world definitely needs more of so thank you thank you so much for saying that uh honored that uh, you've been watching uh, a lot of my shows um it, it, it means a lot that you've taken time to do that honestly uh, i pinch myself on many days uh thinking that wow i actually have 53 episodes on youtube of me blabbering and, and talking about um, personal things but uh you know, I guess when you find your calling in life, you, you never look back. And if there's one thing this podcast taught me that uh, I struggled with before is um, my sensitivity issue and my worry of what will people think of me. And um, I'm at a point I feel where it bothers me a lot less. Mm. And I think that I would I would just like to underscore that for people who are on the fence on wanting to start something, because you said something very important. You said, you know, if you put your, your name out on whatever it is that is out there with that comes criticism and judgment and you know it's a case of brace yourself but if you're able to bypass that point where you put it out there and you get some people nodding away i swear you know just the people who you can count on one hand that said that's amazing will outweigh all the people who are either talking behind your back or the people who are just, you know, bringing some negativity towards your life. Yeah. It'll make you care less about what others think because that's what I've experienced. Yeah. Plus, uh, you know, there, there's there's waiting for the perfect moment, which will never come. There is never a perfect moment no. in time. I love the Chinese proverb, the best time to plant the trees 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Uh, so, you know, might as well get planting. And you know what? What if the young say? Oh, I'm too young. The old say I'm too old. And like everybody has got their rationale, but you know those that can break through that uh, are the ones that we should celebrate. 
this episode is rich in information uh, that uh, is uh, is available for <laughs> for for free. I mean, this is this is amazing. Wallah, I uh, genuinely appreciated uh, all the information uh, that you shared. The conversation is invaluable. Uh, I'll be watch. I look forward to watching this. I look forward to editing this. <laughs> Although we won't be editing much because it's just been such a, a conversation as if we're in a coffee shop. And I think that's one thing that podcasting offers that maybe you don't get in in regular interviews. It's you kind of like you know you take your hat off, you kick back, and you're having an intimate conversation where it's kind of unfiltered. You know. Yeah. If, um, I think the translator is going to probably not have as much fun in translating some of the terminology that you use here. But um, but anyway, it's, it'll be a learning experience. Web, for, web, for talata. <laughs> web, web talata. Thanks, Abdurrahman. Man. I right. really appreciate your time. You too, sir. And uh, all the best, Habibi. Cheers. All right.